friend of ours is a, quite an artist, uh -huh. so she painted out the uh, original oh, neat. and she didn't put mine on it. <laughs> turn, turn, turn it around here. Let me get a little uh, close up of that. Okay. Okay, you can put it on if you want to. Do you want to wear it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Looks good. Good morning. Today is the 14th of February, 2008. I'm Harry Ziegler, a volunteer at the Palm Springs Air Museum here in California. Part of our mission is to record and preserve the history of our country's military conflicts, especially World War II. As part of the Veterans History Program with the Library of Congress, we conduct interviews of veterans and civilians who participated in those conflicts. Today I'm here in the museum with fellow volunteer Dave Thompson. We also have the privilege and honor of interviewing Captain, Captain Harold is it Bauman. Is that it, Frank? Bauman. Bauman. Right. Captain uh, Bauman was a C-47 pilot during the European conflict. So we're here to talk and uh, a lot about other things, and nice to have you here, Harold. Thank you. So if you'd start off and <clears throat> pronounce your name and spell it for us. My name is Harold C. Bauman. Last name is B-A-U-M-A-N-N. <clears throat> and Harold, where were you born? I was born in Philadelphia. In what year? 1921. And uh, when you grew up in that neighborhood, uh, what do you remember about the neighborhood? Was it an ethnic neighborhood or a mixed neighborhood? Or It was, uh, well, when I was in grammar school, um, it was a, uh, shall we say, a Nazi neighborhood. A lot of Germans. <clears throat> a lot of Germans there. As a result, I learned how to fight. <laughs> because yeah. you were not German then, I think. No, sir. Well, uh, German background, but uh, not uh, practicing. And your siblings, did you have brothers and sisters? I had one sister. And the was she sister. Young? She was younger, huh? Yes. And uh, She passed away a few years ago. Can you remember much about your home? What it, what it was like? Uh, it went one story, two story, basement. Uh. Well, you know, we had a typical row house in Philadelphia, and the best part about it was uh, number one, diagonally across the street was an ice house, so the summertime used to hang around over there, keep nice and cool, and uh, across the street, directly across the street from our house, was a a uh, little ice cream shop, and uh, it was an elderly German couple that ran it. They always felt sorry for me, so I got a, a lot of free ice cream cones. <laughs> that made it nice. Now, do you know much about uh, how your mother and dad <clears throat> met each other and where their backgrounds were? Not really. Uh, they both passed away quite a few years ago, but. Uh, <clears throat> My mother was raised by actually what I call my foster grandparents. Uh, they took a liking to her as a child and they were real nice couples so they took her in and pretty well raised her. Well, why, why, why did that happen? That, uh... my, my mother's father uh, was an aspiring actor and moved to Hollywood. And did he have success? He, he, and there, I never heard of him doing much of anything except uh, that he was there. And, uh, and her mother, what, what did she do then that would allow her daughter to go with another family? Well, she there, went were, with the there were two daughters. I see. And uh, without not much money, why it was difficult raising two of them, so I believe she was happy to have the one who he's taken care of. So was it a family friend then that took the daughter in? No, not really. Just a nice, Just a nice couple. And uh, on the other side of the family, do you know much about your dad's side? Huh? 
The only thing I remember, my father's father, I was maybe three years old, was taken to see him when he was on his deathbed. So you never really knew him. I have only, I think, one snapshot of me with my father's father. And so what did your father do? What was his? <clears throat> he did it. Well, during the Depression, he did a lot of jobs. Uh, he drove a taxi. And I'll never forget to see him come in one wintry day with icicles hanging, actually, from his hair. <clears throat> Excuse me. The, in those days, the driver of the taxi was out in the open. The compartment was enclosed for the passengers. That's where he got all that cold, rainy, bitter cold that weather. You remember what kind of car it was? Who made it? I don't remember now. Uh -huh. yeah. And <clears throat> you, did you have something about it? I was going to say an interesting thing is his grandmother came over uh, from, from Germany. Uh, his, uh, there were three sisters. They went to England. And one, his grandmother came to America, about 15 years old, by herself. His uh, one sister, one uh, one of her sisters stayed in England, and the other one went to South Africa. I see. Isn't that amazing? Yes. And so you kind of indicate then you're in somewhat of a commercial neighborhood with the ice house right there, and no, it was residential, but <clears throat> the ice house was a big old building right near the railroad tracks. Can you remember much about your home, what it was like? Was it one story, two stories? Actually, it was just what you call a three-story out of basement. First floor was a living room and kitchen and so on and dining room. And the second floor, so-called, was the bed bedrooms. And how many baths? Did you have one bath? One bath. And I was upstairs by chance? Oh, yeah. So did you have your own bedroom and your sister have her own? Or? Yes. So, you, so there were three bedrooms upstairs. Yeah. Do you remember uh, what the heating was in the kitchen or the house? Was it gas? Or? It was coal fired. Coal fired. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. A coal, coal basement. And uh, yeah, you used to take the ashes out and that sort of thing. Were you still living in that house when the uh, the uh, oil coal came in and it was in a in a little auger and it made clinkers? Well, Did you have that eventually? We, Went through the process first was a uh, strictly anthracite coal, then we went to coke, then we got really up there uh, socially. It had a stoker, so you didn't have to shovel coal in all day long. Yeah, and you had the clinkers in to take out. And then you took the clinkers out, right? And, and they came in handy in the winter time when ice on the sidewalks. You just spread the the ashes there. Now. Was without other than the taxi, was there a car in the family? We had a car a good bit of the time, yes. <clears throat> I remember the the first one I remember was a nineteen twenty three or twenty four Dodge touring sedan. So with that four, four, four door do four doors? Yeah. And convertible top. <laughs> okay. And I remember also that uh, the tires would last maybe 50 miles without having to flatten, having to repair the tire. And they had spoke wheels? Yep. Were they wooden spokes? I, that I don't recall. Uh -huh. no. And the uh, food that your family ate, was there a, a, a particular ethnic tradition in there, you know, certain foods that your your family liked to you know, we. We're pretty uh, broad-minded there. We ate. I learned to eat everything. Uh -huh. <laughs> Either eat it or go hungry. <laughs> was it? Uh, um, my grandmother was was English, and she cooked everything to death. I mean, it was just totally well done. Yeah. And, and, and I didn't know what rare was until I and I left home. You know, went on. <laughs> so, was there always plenty of food? Was there any concern ever about? We never went hungry, fortunately. Uh -huh. So your dad was somewhat successful in, in, in making money to keep the family he going? He kept the family going. He uh, wound up uh, selling life insurance for Metropolitan, yeah. and that was the last 20 years or so. 
He was with that company. So, uh, in high school, grade school, you went all the way through in, in that same home? And no, we moved quite a bit. Okay. Yeah. And but all, all in the same general area, but here, there, and everywhere. Was there a reason for that moving around? Just different jobs your dad had? No, just a matter of the house. They, they raised the rent, so he moved to somewhere else where it was it's more you, affordable. Okay, so you didn't own the home. You were always renting? Always, until I say late, very late 30s, when he finally uh, did buy the home. Uh -huh. That was our last one then. And uh, did that mean changing schools? No. No, because most of the schools were within, within walking distance. He went to the same grammar school, the same junior high school, same high school. And so your sister followed right along behind you? Mm -hmm. How many grades behind you was she? Uh, she was three years. Do you know how your mother and dad met? Not really, no. Uh huh. And at what point, when you get into high school, <clears throat> Uh, what are your interests there? Do you have sports that you uh, particularly in? Basically, uh, shall I say, I was always an entrepreneur. Uh, mostly what I did there was I <clears throat> took up the saxophone and wound up having a little band, which evolved into a large band, but the days of the uh, big bands, uh, in college I had a 15-piece orchestra. In college? Huh? Yeah. The, uh, in high school, I did f photography. I, uh, for example, on our class trip, I took pictures of, random pictures of everybody and made a little album out of them and showed the album around and they could order the pictures they wanted. And so you made and sold pictures yeah. in high school. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. And uh, can you remember what kind of cameras you had? Well, my favorite was the Argo Flex, a twin lens reflex. Uh, I wound up eventually having a, a roller flex, but at the beginning I couldn't afford that. Now, when you say uh, twin reflex or double reflex? It's a twin lens reflex. It's a, one, one of the upper lens was a viewing lens. You look down into the uh, camera and you could view the, the object you were t photographing. So you held the camera this way yes. and looked down. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And it was an Argus? That was an Argus, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> I remember that name. I think I might have even had one, but I'm not, not mm -hmm. sure. So you had uh, any sports that you participated in, or that was strictly uh, your pictures? Just, and not, not as far as this organized sports are concerned, just pick up games. Now, how about uh, mm. learning to play saxophone? Who, did you go to a, a teacher then? And we had a teacher come to the house and when I was in uh, eighth grade, I believe it was, and he gave me lessons almost every week. I know he charged a dollar for each lesson. No kidding. And how, how about your first saxophone? Do you remember much about how you were able to buy a saxophone? Well. Uh, it was a, I would say maybe a 20-second hand uh, alto saxophone, I remember that. But uh, once I uh, got, shall I say, fairly proficient with it, I uh, managed to get a, a very good saxophone, a Somer, which is considered the, the tops in those days. And your you played in a school band or by chance? You yeah, know, with the, I was in the high school band, yes. In the high school, so was it a marching band? Or, mm -hmm. So you, and did you go to like football, basketball games and play, that type of thing? Yeah, strictly f football games. Strictly football. Yeah. And uh, so <clears throat> how big did your band get in high school again? Well, in high school I had a four piece. Four piece, so what would have been the other three? Well, they, actually we were two saxophones a piano and a drummer. Okay. And were they all high school kids? Yeah. And uh, so, uh, was did you go to, did you play for, you know, like the prom or uh, different? Well, uh, we started out playing like mostly church functions and that sort of thing. 
from which we would get 50 cents for the night. Okay. And then uh, when I got to college, but I expanded and uh, wound up, as I say, with a 15-piece band, three vocalists, and uh, we played mostly prompts and large, large affairs. So uh, what <clears throat> subjects were you interested in in high school? Back, frankly, in high school, my main interest was just barely getting through. Just doing it, huh? Mm -hmm. But uh, I always, at the beginning, I wanted to be an aer aeronautical engineer. But our school counselor said, no, no way, no way. You don't have the, uh, the background for it. The subjects you should take, you do, don't, don't do well in. So I was talked out of that. I see. And uh, took a strictly academic course. So what year would you have graduated from high school? I graduated January of 39. 39. Now, <clears throat> were you aware at all of what was going on in Europe? in Japan at the time in 39. Yeah, we, in fact, uh, <coughs> excuse me, we had a... Uh, <coughs> you want water? Yeah. <coughs> we had a uh, teacher who ran the, what is called the Flying Aircraft Model Club. <coughs> we, <coughs> excuse me. We built scale models flying scale models of planes of those days. My favorite was the Fairchild 24, <clears throat> mainly because they had a good glide angle. And we, uh, in fact, won the state championship because we had all kinds of competitions. I see. And uh, the, between my sophomore and junior years in school, he went over to Germany. He was a German, his name was Fritz. And uh, when he came back, he said, told us, you guys are going to be in a war. You knew that in 39? That was back in about 37. 37. Mm -hmm. And did he comment on why he knew that? He saw the way the Germans were training. Uh -huh. <clears throat> they, <clears throat> excuse me, they had a uh, glider program. They weren't allowed for a while to have power airplanes of any amount. So they took taught them to fly with gliders. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said they've got a tremendous number of gliders, a tremendous number of people who are able to fly. Uh -huh. <clears throat> so was there much talk about Japan at the time? No. Did it was all Germany. All Germany. Mm -hmm. Well, being a German neighborhood. Yeah. So what college then? What, what, uh, you, <clears throat> you graduated in 39 from? From high school. From high school. So yeah. what college did you go to? Then I went to the, actually I was going to go into medicine and was accepted at Penn State for the pre-med, except I got cold feet because <clears throat> I knew I don't know anybody there. I have to work my way through. Be difficult. So I heard about the uh, optometry school, which is, was not far from where we lived. I signed up for that. And uh, I fin finished high school in January, started in September. So they had a long, long period of time before. <clears throat> well, it was a pie time to put some money aside. So you went to work somewhere. So I went and I worked. And uh, basically, I made enough that they would not have to work that first year. So and I was able to do? get very good grades. What, what did you do to, uh, to make the money? Well, the saxophone mostly, oh, it's but I worked diff different things, selling shoes, whatever. So, so did you play in your own band or another band? It, mostly my own, it, mostly my own. Were you ever in another band besides your own? I sat in with others where there's, they needed a tenor sax, okay, yeah. I was available. Okay, so <clears throat> how then did you get started with this 15-piece band in college? Well, well it evolved. Say we had a four piece, and then we saw the the bit bigger money was with the bigger bands, so we worked our way up, and uh, I guess we got up to maybe a nine or ten piece band, and then from there went up to the whole shebang. Now, were you <clears throat> mimicking the music from say Artie Shaw or Harry James or 
some of these other people? Or we, how, what, where were your arrangements <coughs> coming from? Mostly, uh, I was very lucky. I, but my piano player could not read music, but he could write it. He could hear a piece and put it on, on put the notes down. When it came to reading music, he was very slow. He had to study it. So, but uh, he wrote, wrote most of our arrangements. Eddie was had an excellent ear. In fact, I'll never forget that we had a little job, just actually a small piece, a small combo, down Atlantic City. And with the train going down, we got talking. We had to, and one of the fellows made a remark that the big hit at that time was. The ink spots with if I didn't care, that number. And uh, we didn't have that arrangement. So I got up my clarinet, and I faked it a bit, and he wrote the notes for everybody that was with on there, so we could play that number. So he, and with, the, you said you had four, three vocalists? Four, yeah. Three vocalists? Yeah. And when, so, when I had the full band, yeah. And so what would have been the breakout in? Trumpet, saxophones, trombones. Uh, we had five saxophones. We had uh, six brass, three trumpets, and three trombones. And we had the four rhythm: uh, piano, drums, uh, bass, and guitar. Okay. And um, then the singers. How did they come about? Well, there were three girls, and. Uh, they knew each other and used to sing together a bit, so we hired all three of them. You know, would they do like the Andrews sisters or something similar at times? Yes, otherwise it was mostly mostly vocals, uh, solos. That's, but uh, yeah. but uh, they did a, a trio once in a while. Now, 1941 rolls around, and you're in your what third year? Couple, yeah, third, third year of college. Mm -hmm. And uh, where might you have been? On Sunday, December seventh. Home studying, preparing for exams the next day, which I didn't get to take, because I went down the next morning to enlist. And how did you hear about it? On the radio. You had your radio on while mm -hmm. you were studying, and uh, I didn't have it on. My father did when he heard the news. He called to me, and I went and listened. Then. Do you remember much about the discussion around the? In the family, after you heard that, oh, it was just a matter of my uh, parents were anti-military, to put it mildly, and uh, in fact, I went down as a sailor enlist the, the the Monday after Pearl, after the day the of Pearl Harbor. When uh, I got there, I wanted to get. I always wanted to fly, so I. Went down to a list of the Army Air Corps and went through everything fine, except when I finished, they said, I know I need my parents' signature because I wasn't 21 yet. In those days, you had to be 21 or get your parents' signature. Uh, you had to have at least two years of college and you had to pass a very stringent physical. Uh, any little thing wrong with you, you were out. So luckily I passed the physical and the written exams and everything else, but uh, I knew my parents were not signed. <clears throat> so I didn't say anything to them. The day I was 21, I went back down. How long a wait was that? Uh, five months. Five months. But you still stayed in school? Yes. Yeah. And then I was the luckiest guy in the world. I actually got sworn in on June the 6th. A very popular day uh, of 1941, and then uh, we uh, went, uh, went back to school, waited to be called. I was actually in the Army Air Corps Reserves. Well, I didn't get called, didn't get called, and finally we uh, had graduation, went to graduation rehearsal in the morning. Went home for lunch, and my mother says a letter from the War Department we here. Opened it, report eight days later. So I even got my doctorate, everything else, took my state boards. I was able to do that today, eight days I had. 
and this was for optometry? Optometry, yes. So you're a, you're a, you said your doctorate. Yeah. <clears throat> How many years did it take in those days to get a doctorate in optometry? In those days it was four years. Four years. However, yeah. uh, when the work came about, why well, they put, accelerated the program. So I graduated a little, about three and a half, and uh, went to service then. So what would have been the day and the year you went on active duty? I went on active duty on uh, February the 16th of 43. And you would have been how old then? I was 22. You're 22 now. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> when they read your resume that you were an optometrist and were a saxophone player and you were going into the Air Corps, how did they look at you when you showed up? It didn't matter. So they wanted. They, they, they needed pilots. They wanted you as a pilot. Yes. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. So I got through my flight training. And where'd you go for that? We went, uh, well, extended period. First, we went to Miami Beach for, for five weeks in February, which was a good place to be in February. Do you remember the name of the base? With no base. They took over the hotels. I see. We stayed in, it was a Martha Washington Hotel, something like that. Was it basic training then, no flying, just, or were there flying involved? No, not there. Then from there, we, they sent us to a college training detachment. That was at uh, Wittenberg College, now U University, in Springfield, Ohio. Can you remember, and, <coughs> now, during this period of time, how are you getting from these one base to another? By train. By train. Mm -hmm. And at Wittenberg, we got there and they tell us what we're going to study. Physics, algebra, trigonometry, and first aid were the main courses. So I asked permission to see the CEO. I said, sir, I was the assistant to the professor of mathematics teaching algebra and trigonometry. I used to tutor in physics and I have a doctorate. Why do I need first date? He said, what are, you, what are you going to do while you're here? Well, it so happened, most of the fellows in our band enlisted also, six of them were in the same place. Oh, no kidding. So I said, Joe, no, you don't have a, a band here, do you? A marching band or a dance band or anything? No. Would you like to have one, sir? Oh, yes, yes. So I spent three months doing nothing but playing the saxophone and just rehearsing the band and that sort of thing. So did, did you change the command ceremonies and marching or was it a... Every a Saturday night? was a formal parade, and, yeah, and pass review, the whole thing. So you'd band. stand out in front with the band and yeah. people would march by you and then you'd go at the end or... Well, I, was, I was just in the band or the marching band and you had a, somebody, a drum major, the whole bit. Did they collect other people then? Uh, how big was it, the band? You had about 35 uh, pieces. Okay. I went to town and talked to the people at the USO, and they managed to scrounge up the instruments. Now, you mentioned something that got my curiosity. <clears throat> when your dad said you, and your teacher said you weren't qualified for these courses to aeronautical engineering, it sounds to me like you were supremely qualified. To do yes. those things. I just, it's, in high school, I wasn't particularly interested in getting good grades, you know, but one it, of those things. But it, you really took off in college. Yeah. You, you, so math and science and those things. I was the first one in the history of the school to get a hundred average in math for the whole year. I'll be done. Mm -hmm. You just never know, do you? No. <laughs> it's, it's what we feel with our kids, they all turned out real well. and. And the one, particularly our younger son, was considered a clown back in high school. Today he's vice provost at the University of Missouri. That'll be nice. Yeah. Doctorate. Yeah. He has now, a doc PhD. You're in Ohio, you said? Now, Wittenberg, yeah, Wittenberg Witt College in Ohio. Okay. And that, is, again, is more ground training, no flying? We, we've got 10 hours at a Piper Cub. Was with the civilian first. instructors? With the civilian instructors. Mm -hmm. And did they actually let you solo the Piper Cub? No. 
no, you, you flew it, but uh, landed and took off and everything else. But uh, it, they wouldn't allow your soul. No. So is, was it just an orientation to see if you might fly? Basically, yes. Okay. So you complete, what did you say, how many months you were there? Three we, months? We were there three months. Three months in Ohio. Then what happened? And from there we went to pre, to pre-flight out in San Antonio. <clears throat> they called that the Cadet Center. What was the name of the field? Do you remember? It wasn't. It was just the Cadet Center, a uh, SAAC, I think, it was uh, Aviation Cadet Center. But, uh -huh. <clears throat> and the trip. Can you remember much about what it was like in those days to ride a train? Because most people these days don't even know. I'll never forget the first train down to Miami Beach. I had three days of my exams for my state boards. The third day was oral exams, supposed to take all day. I managed to convince them that I had to, had to leave. We were supposed to, I was supposed to report 6 o'clock that morning. I called the reserve center. They said, well, if you get this train by, by noon, you'll be okay. Well, it didn't leave until 4 o'clock, so I had time to spare, but uh, I managed to get my state boards completed. Got on the train, it was steam engine, wooden seats, very, very, shall we say, un uncomfortable. It took three days for us to get to, Bi to Miami Beach. Where did you eat then, on the train? On the train. They had a, actually a baggage car that they converted into a so-called kitchen. So it was all military? Yes. The whole train? Oh, yes. And uh, when we... Uh, took off that first night, we well, everybody just sat up. Well, the train had to stop every so often to get water. So one of the stops that made that next second day, I saw a hardware store. I ran over and got a couple of screwdrivers. That night, we took the sheets apart, laid them down flat, and were able to sleep. <laughs> the conductor came in, raising the devil about what he was doing to his train. A couple of the guys picked them up and tossed them out. <laughs> uh, so it was just military chow in the old uh, baggage right. car. And I pulled KP duty the third day, peeling potatoes all, all day. Did the restrooms hold up with that many people on the train? How'd they handle those? Do you remember? Well, they still were able to use them, huh? They, oh, yeah. Okay. They, and <clears throat> Can you remember the name of the, the the line, like New York Central, Pennsylvania? I think we left the, the B and O station in Philadelphia, but I don't remember if it was a B and O or not. Because I remember <coughs> my uncle was born in 1897, and I got a newspaper for him on the day he was born, and all the ads or the stock quotes in the paper were railroads. There must have been 200 of them, all different railroads. Oh, yes. And, uh, well, railroad was the main transportation in those days. Hundreds of these stocks that were all railroads. So and the first uh, commercial plane to, to actually make it, shall we say, was the DC-3. And they uh, converted that to the C-47, which is what I flew during the war. Now, during this period of time, you never had a car, or did you have your own car? I got my own car when it was my third year of school. In college? In college. What kind of car was it? It was a third, 1937 Ford two-door. Two-door coupe. Did it have a rumble seat? No, no, it was a sedan. Sedan. A sedan. And uh, I, I docked it up a bit, as kids will do. As a result, my future wife would not ride in it. <laughs> When you say doctor it up, what do you mean? Well, uh, it was a it was black. I painted the wheels, the wheels themselves, uh, yellow, and the grill. Every third stripe I made yellow, two black, one yellow, two black, one yellow. <laughs> <laughs> when he took me out, he had to borrow his father's car. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't do it, huh? <laughs> uh, he, no. had a, he had a thirty-nine Pontiac. So, you're dating then your current wife at mm -hmm. this time? 
Yeah. Where did you meet her? Actually, uh, she was in the same class as my sister. Okay. And they had been going out as a group, and uh, one evening they, my sister invited them back to our house, and uh, while they, I heard the noise downstairs, I was up studying, I came down and I spotted that redhead over there. I wasn't the rest was history. <laughs> so, uh, were you involved in any church activities at these times? I mean, would you have met uh, women and girls and through church or anything? Or? Through, through the saxophone. Through the saxophone. Did you have a religion, family religion at the time? We didn't practice it, no. No, no, go, no church going in? No. Okay. And uh, you're now in, in uh, San Antonio? In, in Cadet? Cadets, we started in San Antonio. And so what would you have done there? That was just a matter of all ground school, uh, plus uh, a lot of marching, calisthenics, and that sort of thing. Now you're that single or married at this time? No, we weren't married then. You weren't married. And then uh, we got nine weeks there. Now, let me ask, where is your wife-to-be living now while you're gone and doing all these things? We were not dating then. Oh, you weren't? Well, they, I met him when I graduated high school. Uh, I had heard about him for years and years and years. He was a very handsome young man, very handsome. And all my friends would tell, I would talk about little St. Bauman's brother. And they were very friendly with little St. I was never friendly with her. We, were, we went to school together from kindergarten, and I just knew yeah. her, that was all. Yeah. And this is my first time ever at, uh, when I went, went back, this group went back. We've been going on picnics together ever since uh, our last trip. At, senior high school class trip and uh, I was sitting there waiting for the house and he came down and I thought so that's not a <laughs> Bauman's brother <laughs> I was surprised so you're that. back in Pennsylvania yeah, okay. yeah I was just at graduating high school so is there letters going back and forth you know and our correspondence was our courtship your courtship in fact she almost married the mailman <laughs> <laughs> I said our, our uh, Romance came through the mail okay. because we went together that summer, and then we stopped. And then just before he went uh, went into into service, I guess mm -hmm. you took me out, and you started writing to me, yeah. and I graduated slowly, writing more and more and more. At first, <laughs> now I didn't. this cadet program. How many cadet classes would there have been in San Antonio at the same time? I mean. How big an outfit are we talking about now? There are close to 10,000 cadets there. 10,000. <clears> how <throat> for how many months? We were there nine weeks. Nine weeks. Mm -hmm. And they were all going into pilot training. Well, well, those that made it, yes. Those that made it. <clears throat> and what would have washed them out if it would cause them not to have been successful? Well, lacking the shall we say, coordination to be able to fly a plane properly. So a lot of them went into uh, bombardier and navigator. Mm -hmm. uh, Were they still giving you uh, eye tests and all that? Uh, oh, yes. Every time you went to another base, you got you, an eye? You had what they call the 6-4, which is a flight physical. You had that quite often. 6-4, what would that have meant? Well, that was the complete, rather stringent uh, physical. Uh, <clears throat> For example, when it came to your eyes, uh, you had to have a, a minimum of 20-20 vision. Not barely, but a minimum. Yeah. You had to be able, most of us had to do 2015 and 2010. Uh, later on, they became a little less strict about it. But at the beginning, they were very strict. And uh, well, for example, I. Uh, Took my six four in. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to remember now. I think it was in the primary, and uh, now it was in, ba in basic, which is the second phase of, of flight training, and uh, the flight surgeon says to me, uh, oh, you're, "You're grounded. Why am I grounded? You have an eighty percent deviation of the septum." which was rather common in the Philadelphia area with the sinus conditions. He said, so what's that got to do with 
said, well, you can't take altitude. Sir, I was just at the altitude chamber yesterday, went up to 40,000 feet. No, nah, no. So he washed me out. Well, luckily, one of the uh, other fellows in my squadron, his, his brother-in-law was the chief flight surgeon. So he managed to get me an appointment with him. And I told him what happened. And he says, well, I cannot overrule him. But I'm going to tell him I want him to get in the chamber with you and take you up and see how you do. Well, when I carried the flight surgeon out, I, he changed his mind and allowed, allowed me to continue flying. You never know. Yeah. Because I, for some reason, altitude never bothered me. So three months there in San Antonio, and where do you go from there? Well, from there we went to Sykes, in Missouri for our primary flight training. What town is that? Any big town near that area? That must have been early spring, maybe April, May. And when you say, was it like near uh, St. Louis or was it near uh, Columbia or any big town of any note? Wasn't too far from Dayton, but we never got there. Okay. Because we couldn't get any, any leave at all while we were there. Okay, and so <clears throat> you're in a, a, a class that's taking you into a basic trainer? Right, we, we went uh, from pre-flight, went to what's called primary flight training. You flew the PT-19. There you sold. And you did all kinds of precision flying. Not no formation, but just yourself doing lazy aids and that sort of thing with the instructor. Everything well coordinated a little bit. Then uh, from there we went to basic training where we flew the BT-13, otherwise known as the Volti Vibrator, because it shook all over the place. And had an electric prop? No. No? No. And then uh, there we did a little, the very first formation flying, rather loose, but uh, still in, in a formation, and did some aerobatics. Uh, in fact, uh, we had a, I had an instructor that uh, should not have been an instructor, I'll put it that way. But uh, he, one day went up and he said, uh, climb up to at least uh, 10,000 feet. So I climbed up there and he said to me, uh, let's see how many loops you can do before you get too low. And that's all I did that day, one loop after the other. Back up to 10,000 loops again. So I got disgusted with that. I asked permission to see the CEO and uh, told him what had happened. And I said, I cannot, cannot see that instructor. Am I learning anything from him? He said, uh, I said, well, what do you want to do? He said, well, transfer you to the medical corps of practice optometry. So he looked at me and said, I have a proposition for you. He said, uh, if I give you your assignments, you go up and practice them yourself. At that point, we're about in our fifth week out of nine weeks. He said, uh, at the end of that time, I'll take you up for a check ride. If you pass it, you stay in flight training. If you don't, I'll transfer you to the medical corps. I said, that sounds fair enough. So he gave me my assignments, just sketches on paper of what, what maneuvers to practice. At the end of the time, I took my check ride with him and passed it. So I went on. Never heard of that. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. And that would have been at the end of how many weeks? That was, each, each section was nine weeks. So it was nine weeks of primary, nine weeks of basic. Then you went on to advanced training for another nine weeks. So primary was Volte Vibrator? No, the primary was the PT-19, Fairchild. You had 13, 19. The and, and then and the, the PT-13 was the basic training. Uh -huh. And then you went on to advanced training where we flew, I, I opted for a twin engine. So I went to the bit AT-17, which was a Cessna-built aircraft. And um, 
that's your advanced training then? Yes. They were all at the same base? No. Okay. Each one was different. Uh, there, I was at Lubbock for advanced training. And I was at Strother Field in Kansas for the basic. Okay. Now, do you still have a car? Or no, no. Your, your car's gone? Yeah, we are. Okay. I sold that before I went to service. And <clears throat> can you remember much about uh, the accident rate during these different training facilities, what it was like in basic and on through uh, primary and then advanced? Uh, well, <clears throat> basic, I had my, shall I say, worst experience in flying. Uh, <clears throat> we were do doing our night flying, just going around a course and take off, land, come in land, take off again, that sort of thing. And they had two runways, so we're going this way. And uh, one was a right-hand turn, the other to the left. And as I'm coming in on approach, a final approach, oh, I thought my plane had caught fire. Tremendous fire. Yours did? It wasn't my plane, it was the other runway. And two planes that come in, one touched the wing of the other, and down it went. My mother was visiting at the time. So after I, I, another controller took over, it was a lot better than the one we had previously. And he got everybody calmed down and circled and then finally brought us in one at a time to land. When I landed, I taxied over, parked the plane, the lineman came over and said, uh, the CEO wants to see him. I went to see him, wondering what I did wrong. And uh, he said, you understand your mother's here? Yes, sir. She's staying in such such a place? Yeah. Did you meet Mrs. So-and-so? Oh, yes. He said, well, it was her son that just went in. Mm -hmm. He said, now, I'm sending an officer over there to give her the news. But I want you to go along so she'll see someone She'll recognize, at least. So I just went there, stood there while he told her, and that was tough, I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was, that was the first uh, of our fellows that, that bought it. Yeah. Advanced training, we lost quite a few. It was a little bit of everything? Yeah. Well, advanced, we uh, were in Lubbock, Texas, and uh, it was very few settlements around there. So we did their night flying. There were no lights on the ground. And on a dark, uh, shall we say, overcast night, you had no horizon or anything else to go by. And I was fortunate that I had an instructor who drilled into us the fact that you should trust your instruments, not the seat of your pants. And we had quite a few fellows that went in from vertigo. They'd be flying along, thinking they were level, just constantly going over and over until boom. In fact, uh, I, mean, I remember five in particular. Five of them. Mm -hmm. And this was in what type of airplane? The AT-17, a twin engine. It was called a bamboo bomber. It was slow, but uh, very stable. It was a uh, Cessna aircraft with uh, Jacob's engines, and uh, it was meant nothing to me at the time. But when I opened my first office in Pottstown, Pennsylvania, I found out that the Jacob's engine plant was right there in Pottstown. That's where the engines came from. Now, would there have been a two-man crew in this airplane, or one? No, you, you flew a solo most of the time. Solo. But was there another seat on the right? Uh, no, the instructor, either the instructor was with you or, or you were solo. And uh, was, was the instructor behind you or next to you? Next. So, it was a tandem seating. Yeah, that's what so, I was, two, two, I'm not two familiar seat. with that, that name. I'm having trouble trying to yeah. remember, remember, remember what it might have looked mm -hmm. like. Yeah, it was side by side. Uh, two sets of controls. Uh -huh. But the instructor sat in the right seat, you flew the left. So. <clears throat> when you finish your advanced training, roughly how many hours will you now have flying? 
Actually, at that time, I think I had close to 400. That many? That's <clears throat> quite a bit. Yeah, you, you flew almost every day. That's why I, I tell fellows that they want to learn to fly, join the service. Yeah. You really get your training. And <clears throat> it, it's, is it one of these situations where they write up a little sheet after every hop and, and on what you did and how well you did? Or, uh, is there a record of every flight you made, or is it? Well, you kept a log book. Yes. Just your log book. Yeah, it's all. But there's no written record where the instructor. There, there might, there. I'm sure somewhere in the archives, they have a record of that, but uh, I don't have it. So, what are you hearing about what's going on uh, in the two different theaters where war is going on? What, what's the talk around the, the club or wherever you're going? You're, you're still a. A still cadet, a cadet. You're a cadet. Yes. So you go to a cadet club. Uh, well, we had recreation. Oh, that was about it. No real club. You, you, <clears throat> did you buy anything besides beer? They had a, the near near beer, three three point two, I think it was. Okay. And <clears throat> what what what's the talk about? You know, uh, what the guys. You know what? They, what do they want to get into? Are you strictly in multi-engine now? Did yes. You, you you're headed that way, and that's where you're going to go. Right. Okay. So, um, is there much talk about whether they want to go to to the Pacific or to the Atlantic, or do you have no choice in that? Well, frankly, uh, I wanted to, be, to go to the European theater. And that was because of. No. I seem more, a little more civilized, put it that way. <laughs> was it have anything to do with your German background? And that? Actually, uh, that was a deterrent. Because uh -huh. I was told that being a, having a German background, why they would probably treat you worse if you were caught than it would otherwise. I see. <clears throat> and you get through uh, your advanced training about when? That was April of 40, 44. April of 44. And what happens then? Then we went on to what's called transition training, where we learned to fly the C-47. At what field? That was at uh, uh, Sedalia, Missouri, Sedalia Army Air Base. And <clears throat> when you start out in the C-47, you know, you <clears throat> we Got a, not a great picture, but the one up here. Could you take a minute and just point a little bit at that at that airplane and and what and what you remember about it? What I remember about it mainly? Yeah, it's a real workhorse. The thing did what you wanted it to do. No question about it. It uh, didn't fly itself, but it was a very stable airplane to fly. Uh huh. <clears throat> For example, <coughs> excuse me, this shows a glider too. You have that long rope hooked to the glider. Now, that the Waco glider, the CG4A, could not go over 120 miles an hour. So it meant we were flying, just mushing it along, not to exceed that speed. Uh -huh. And uh, <clears throat> in fact, I'll never forget uh, one of the fellows in my tent over in France. Dick Kane was in front of me pulling a glider when the wing came off. The glider? Mm -hmm. Was it full of troops? Yes. Mm. But uh, in fact, I think I have a picture somewhere of the, the wreckage of it. But uh, you had to be very careful with them. And they, they had to be sure to stay a little bit above you so your prop wash wouldn't catch them. and and uh, make it difficult for them. So how long would your checkout in the 47 have been? It could have been anywhere from three to six months. Uh, I was one of those that finished early, I guess, did it in three months. Mm -hmm. And then we went overseas. So by now you're up around 500 hours of flying. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> what would be the things that you would have been taught with the C-47? What kind of missions would you have been taught to perform? We did uh, 
well, pulling gliders, taking paratroopers, uh, a lot of formation flying. Can you remember uh, <clears throat> where you started off with the gliders? Were they on the deck, or did you come through and catch them on the ground with that little rope that was hung up between two poles? Uh, well, we, I have made one of those that did some of that, but uh, normally you didn't do that. You uh, normally they were on the ground. You taxied forward slowly until the rope tightened, and the glider started to move. And you gave it full power to get off. What? Uh, how much did that increase your takeoff? Do you remember? <clears throat> Basically, with it with a glider tow, uh, if the uh, <clears throat> If the rope was fairly taut when you uh, started a roll, why it may increase wasn't very much because I say that you couldn't go over 120. We take off at about uh, 70, 75. The glider at about that point was up well up in the air, and then you just increased your speed. Now, were you <clears throat> flying in miles per hour or knots in those days? That was. We, we worked in miles. You were in miles. Yeah. <clears throat> and can you remember whether the gliders had any instruments in them at all? Did they, are they anything that would... I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> <laughs> the powers that be decided at one point that being a tow pilot, you should really check out in the glider to learn what they go through. Have a feeling for them. My turn came at night. So and I think it was 12 or 13 gliders and, and pilots out there. <clears throat> they assigned me to the lead glider for some reason. We got it, took off to fly a 200 mile triangle across country and come back. Well, everything went well except he had no instruments. There was, a, there was a compass in there. The one in the glider I had just kept going round and round and round. It was useless. So I just managed to stay behind the tow plane. And the others followed me. We were just in single file. And uh, we made the first two turns, and so now we know we're heading back to the field. But a storm came up. Now there were no lights at all. Completely black. So I'm f I'm flying with the tow plane, and mainly you could see the blue exhaust from the engines, so you're able to keep your position very well that way. And uh, we figured, see, the time is about up. So I figured, okay, let's uh, watch for the field. And I'm looking and looking, and I see a smudge spot. Ah, they got a smudge spot the other runway. No lights, but at least so I cut. Headed for the smudge spot. And gee, a terrible crosswind it must have come up because I'm grabbing to beat the band to stay lined up with it. And uh, finally, I got close enough to see the smudge spot was in the back of a Jeep they were taking across the field to the runway. Now, not having any power to put into it, I couldn't go around, so I just had to land. And we, I came down, I saw. A line up of airplanes parked here and buildings over here, and I was in between them. <laughs> and all, all the gliders got down well. No no damage, nobody hurt. That's wonderful. Yeah, just I'm lucky. A, you say uh, you were in this uh, glider by yourself. There was oh, yeah. No, no one else in there but yeah. you. And uh, you 200 miles at 120 knots, that's a long time to sit back there at night and yeah. just watch two exhausts. Right. <laughs> well, there were lights on the ground up until that last maybe 15 minutes or so when the storm came up. Now, can you remember what your memories are of flying that glider, you know, what, what your thoughts were about how it performed, uh, whether it was responsive, whether it was kind of loggy or what did you think of it? Well, we had no load in it, so it was, it was very responsive. But at the same time, uh, you figure you have no real control because what you're doing is trying to keep it level. 
uh, and at the right altitude uh, above the tow plane because uh, you had no nothing to worry about as far as an engine was concerned and Could you how much it? power or anything did else. It, did it have any trim tabs or anything or did you just have to? Just put it by the stick. The, mm -hmm. Was it a stick? Well, no, it was a wheel. You had a yoke. Uh, was there only on one side the yoke, or was it on both? Just the one I was in, I think, was only the one side. Okay. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> when you went to learn about paratroop drops, was there anything special about that that you had to learn? Well, basically the same idea. You slowed down for the drop. Uh, we would get down maybe to 100, 110, and uh, in practice, they they jumped at a higher altitude, and what they, what they did with during a campaign. But uh, I would say we jumped them mostly about 700 to 1,000 feet. Mm -hmm. And was there did <clears throat> did you ever be in a position where you were the lead aircraft, the pathfinder, or were you? Normally, flying formation on other airplanes. How yes. did that work? Well, in the in the Europe, there was a Pathfinder outfit. I was not assigned to that. I was just assigned to regular squadron. So, we put in formation. Now, when did you get commissioned? April '44. From what field to what field? When when did you actually become an officer? Well, like we got our wings and commission at Lubbock, Lubbock Army Air Base. And you had finished training in what? 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 Training? That was our advanced training. You're in the C-47. No, that was in the uh, AT-17. Okay, the twin-engine right. training plane. Okay, so <clears throat> that when you finished that training successfully, you became an officer. Right. Okay, so you became a second lieutenant in the uh, Army Air Corps. Right. All right, and now you're flying C-47s, and you're you get tight and glider training. You get para drops. How about cargo? Did you get cargo pushing out with parachutes or anything? Not there, no. Not there, no. Okay, what else might you have learned uh, in, in in the C-47s and base in your advanced training? Any other particular thing other than just flying the airplane? No, basically, uh, you were you, you got to talk to paratroopers, for example, and to glider pilots, and to find out their their worries uh -huh. and what you should not do, what you try, must try to do to get them safely to where they had to be. So we would. Uh, for example, just have both sessions, and you'd be talking to some of the paratroopers, and they would. They, they, their big worry was that the plane would kick when they're ready to jump. In other words, if I hit a bump, the tail would come up, and they get caught in the tail. That sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So you try to do your very best to keep that plane as as smooth and level as possible at that point. So we used to practice, for example, uh, going in without paratroopers, going into a certain area, then okay, we're got to the drop zone, going to give them the green light to, to jump. Just prior to that, you put the plane into a mild mush, so just go along steadily, don't change anything, let it just go along. Now, <clears throat> you're there just three months. Training is that correct? I my mind was three months. Some some were there as long as six. And are you uh, then getting o overseas orders? Are people yes. going from that training overseas? Right. And so when do you find out what where you're going? We were at uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana, Bear Field, and there we got our orders for overseas. Now in this C-47 training, did you ever do a mass? flying operation with, you know, say 10, 15, 20 other airplanes and paratroopers. Did you ever do any of those big drops practicing? Not a, not a real big one, but we did it with maybe half a dozen planes. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. And then, so <clears throat> you get orders overseas, 
And where are you and your girlfriend at this point with you leaving to go overseas? Where is that? We had been married uh, months. three months prior. When you went to C-47 training? Yes. And so you get married? And we got married while I was there, yes. So you're now married to a second lieutenant in the Army Air Corps. Right. Okay. So you're a military wife. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> she knows that you're going overseas even, and so the marriage is in, in regardless. You're going and you're going married. Mm -hmm. Okay, now what gets you overseas? How, how, how do you get over there? We, we flew over at C-47. <clears throat> and how did that route, what was that route? Do you remember? We went uh, the northern route uh, from uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana, went up to Goose Bay, Labrador, and got orders there to take off at midnight for Iceland. Well, we got off okay. About an hour out, we uh, had to shut down our, our right engine. The uh, found out when we got back to Goose Bay, Labrador, that the uh, engine bolts had worked loose. With the new airplane, had about ten hours on it when we picked it up. Holding the engine on the airframe, those bolts. Yep. So it would start vibrating then. Yep. Okay. So it vibrated so much we had to shut it, had to shut it down. Went back on one engine. Okay. And, and that was at midnight, as I say, where it took off. So a little bit scary. Well, you, you know, sometimes you, depending on the year, that far north, it, the sun never really goes down. It gets a little dark, and then it comes right back up again. <laughs> uh, I've flown over there a couple of times where the sun never really set. It no. just goes down to the horizon and right back up again. <clears throat> yeah. But Goose Bay is not quite that far north, so no. you, had, you had blackness. <laughs> but did you go on over to Keflavik, I mean to uh, the Sasserac or something in, in Greenland? Was that your next? No, we were supposed to go directly to Iceland. All the way to Iceland. Yeah, but um, we went back, we took a couple of days, we checked every darn nut and bolt that airplane. And then uh, when we took off, then we ordered to go to Greenland, Iceland, and Scotland. Okay, so you're, you're the plane. You're the commander. You're the plane commander. Is that correct? No, I was the co-pilot. You're a co-pilot on this. In so fact, the, the fellow pilot of that plane, Art, was uh, had been overseas already. Had flown a while over there, but he took sick. They sent him back to the states. Now he's going back again. Okay. So, and you had a crew <clears> chief then. There's a there's a three more than three people on the plane. There, we had a crew of five. Okay. Uh, pilot, co-pilot. A navigator, a uh, radio operator, and the crew chief. Now, what <clears throat> would the navigator have had to navigate with? How would he be navigating? He had a sexton. Just a sexton. And, and, and uh, radio signals. <coughs> Excuse me. When we were going to Iceland, we had the, the old DITDA system. The radio where, range. And, uh, if you're right on course, you got a solid tone, otherwise you got a dit or a da. Yeah, an A on the right and an N right. on the left. And right. Yeah. And then, uh, so we're right on, the, right on the beam. And Bob, the navigator, comes up and said, I'm going to take a sighting just to keep in practice. So he got in the navigator's dome, and first thing I know, he's coming rushing up. He said, turn 30 degrees right. Turn 30 degrees. He's all excited. What's the matter, Bob? We're right on the beam. Turn 30 degrees right, David. Turns out the German, we found out later, a German sub was up above Iceland broadcasting at the same frequency. Oh, no, no kidding. Did so that affect other if airplanes? If we hadn't checked that, we'd have been off somewhere out of fuel. <laughs> Did other people have that same problem? That they, that oh, they, yeah. were, they were aware of it? That's interesting. Yeah. And <clears throat> the range, uh, how far? In distance, would you have been able to normally go with a normal load of fuel in your C-47? They burned a little over 90 gallons an hour. We carry 800 gallons, uh -huh. so we did be able to get a good seven hours with a, with a spare. And your your true airspeed would have been what? We we cruise mostly between 150 and 160. And what altitude would be a normal? Now, basically, we would stay, I would say, that type of flying, about 8,000 feet. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Um, I'm sure you're familiar with Glacier Girl, the P-38 that landed in Greenland. And I the met, weather up there is... I met one of the fellows that flew that. In fact, he spoke at our Rotary Club. Okay. Uh, McManus was his name. And uh, they, he was told a story about it and uh, how they dug the plane back up out of, out of 200 feet of ice and that sort of thing. Well, very, very interesting. When you went over, was there a way of knowing much about the weather getting all the way over to uh, to Iceland, or was there a... You, you kept your fingers crossed that they knew what they were talking about. Did, did you, you didn't trust it too much, but... You didn't have de-icing on that airplane, did you? We had de-icing, yeah, de boots, yeah. You had boots and prop yeah. ice and all that? Alcohol mm -hmm. for the propellers? No, just, just the boots. Just the boots, yeah. yeah. And <clears throat> so you get to where in England? You, you, I'm sure you refueled then in... in uh, well, Iceland. Yeah, well, then, then we went down to Scotland, to Glasgow. Okay. And then from there, took a train down to Memory in England. Okay. And that's the field that you're going to be? That's where we're stationed there. What Air Force would have been there? Memory Air Base. But what, what Army Air Corps, what Air Force? Like, well, first, was it 8th or? We first got there, it was the 9th Air Force. Okay, 9th. Then they changed it to the Troop Carrier Command. Okay. Then we wound up in the 1st Allied Airborne. That was the name of the, the command, 1st Allied Airborne. Yeah. So were you with other countries then when they said yeah. Allied? We, we jumped English, we jumped uh, French, jumped Australian. Mm -hmm. So when was your <clears throat> first combat mission? That one I'll never forget. Uh, when you, in those days, Things were done very formally in the Army. You reported to the CO when you got to your base, and I reported to him, sir, name, rank, zero, and you know, a little bit. And then he said, sit down, and he gave me a, the history of the, of the outfit, the 79th Squadron. And uh, his final words were, just remember one thing, son. He was a, before the war, he was a uh, check pilot for TWA. He said, uh, remember, when you get that airplane, you strap that thing around you and take it where you want to go. The next day we take off on my first combat mission. And uh, You in the right seat. Yeah. And uh, I'm looking up ahead, I see the flak is so solid, it could have walked on it. And uh, I remember his words. Take the airplane where you want to go. I want to go that way. <laughs> but uh, but I followed the old man. His plane never wavered. Went right into it. So okay, I'll go too. I had my much choices. Bucky was flying the plane, <laughs> and uh, we went right in there. And luckily, we got back out again. Now, the plane on our right did not. You were dropping troops or what? Paratroopers that day. And where was this? Where was the drop? What were you over? We were over France, uh, actually uh, eastern part of France. Now, so the war, the eastern part of France is getting pretty close. The Ardennes to, area, yeah. In the Ardennes. Yeah. Okay. And uh, can you uh, remember much about the situation of the war at that time? What what your briefings was on how, where the Allies and the Germans and what was going on? Well. This was the end of August. Uh, D Day was in June. So it was three months since they got into, into France. And uh, that meant that they were pretty well in there. Uh, let's see, Reims, I remember th th that was occupied by the Americans. That was in pretty well. Can you remember what? Omaha and the different beaches looked like when you flew over them? Oh, yeah. What were some of your memories of that? Well, uh, Omaha Beach, I remember seeing the cement uh, pilings that were there to prevent craft, air, sea craft from being able to just pull right in. How about shipping? Were a number of ships still sunk out there? Or can you remember much about what, what it looked like uh, where Point Duhok and and all the way up to Gold Beach, what any of that looked like? 
just he, looked like uh, any shoreline. And didn't you couldn't see any of the the trash left over from the landing? No, you couldn't see it. No. And uh, when how many? I only remember uh, two or three major parachute drops. You know, they had Market Garden, they had uh, the 101st and the 82nd Airborne. But you obviously were dropping troops all the time. We 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 worked with both of them. Uh, actually, uh, after that, Patton was making his drive across France with his tanks. We flew resupply to them. Uh, he he would send out a couple of scout tanks to take a, a pasture and radio back. We come in, land that pasture, and drop off these five-gallon jerry cans of gasoline. And uh, were they? In a, a group of them and on a pallet or something, or with one? No, they're all individual. We would, uh, when we landed, the whole crew would line up well, and take land, care of them. You'd land the airplane and Oh, yeah. Okay. And uh, you just carry the, these cans back and uh, and have people on the ground to take it away from from the plane so you could get out of there and let the next plane come in. You know? And. Uh, <laughs> The Germans were, were right there shooting us with 60 millimeter mortars. Right. And uh, they, they'd pile the, these jerry cans under the wing of the plane to just get, to get them out and, get, and lined up. And then when the tanks got there, they came through, they just each picked up their supply of gas and went on. Oh, my darn. With, with the tanks, the tanks picked them up. Yeah. Um, were you, I'm trying to get, in September, so Patton's south and pretty soon the Battle of the Bulge comes up? That was in Christmas of 44. So are you involved in supply drops for the people there? Yes, they were. In fact, the first day we went in, the weather was so bad, you dropped the supplies for 500 feet and uh, you couldn't go much lower because the parachute wouldn't have time to open but uh, I would just get snatches of the ground here and there and uh, I just hope our supplies got to them because we had to do it by guess or by gosh you didn't know for sure exactly what, what you didn't know where, where the wind was blowing which way the, the parachutes would drift that sort of thing. Uh -huh. Well, when you first started dropping, was it for the first four or five days that you couldn't get in there at all, could you, with the weather? We got in right after Christmas. I don't have my logbook with me, unfortunately, but it was, I think it was the day after Christmas. Uh huh. And because I remember looking at the meadow uh, where they drop this stuff, and uh, it's, it's saying nothing's ever been built there. It's still. The same as it was yeah. mm -hmm. back in World War II. No, uh, we didn't have radar to yeah. tell us where to drop it or anything else. Just a matter, of, I say by guess. So you've made, and at some point you become plane commander. Yeah. How long did it take you to achieve that? Five or six weeks. Okay. And are they losing many airplanes at this time? Or? We were lucky in our squadron. We didn't lose an awful lot. Uh, I, the first mission I flew, uh, why, why, the plane on my right, I, the only thing I can assume happened was that they machine gunned and got the pilot and co-pilot. Because all of a sudden I saw the plane was right in formation and then all of a sudden it just nosed down with all the paratroopers still in it. So how many would have been in the airplane? We usually had a stick of 17 uh, paratroopers. Uh -huh. With the Americans, when you hit that button for turn the green light on back there for them, you knew they, they'd be out in 11 seconds. But lockstep. No kidding, that's, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and the French. What's that on? You told me about the English and the French when you dropped them. Mm -hmm. Was it different well, with the different services? How well, they with the English, each one got to the door, checked the wind, 
look around, then he'd jump. Sometimes he'd go around three times before they got them all out. <laughs> With the French, uh, now our jump master jumped. He, he checked everybody that were hooked up properly to the static line, and then he got was the last one in line, and they all went out lockstep, 11 seconds. The French, uh, the jump master didn't jump, didn't even put on a parachute. He uh, made sure everybody else jumped. And uh, at one point, uh, my crew chief came up and said, you realize that SOB? He shot one of the paratroopers. He, the guy froze at the door. He tried to push him out and he didn't go, so he pulled out his pistol and shot him. Wow. So when we got back to the base, I uh, went over to the jump master and told him, he better pray he doesn't go on my airplane again. Because he said, you shoot anybody else, you're going out without the parachute. Good for you. Now, mm -hmm. what are you, when do you make first lieutenant? How long does it take to do that? Actually, finally got it, I think, was 45, uh, maybe April, May. So you have almost a year as a second lieutenant, yeah. and after a few weeks you're a plane commander. And where normally do you, are you, do you get the lead? Uh, <clears throat> what would be a normal formation? How many, it would be three? Three, three six? planes normally, yes. That'd and be, uh, the, your flight leader was a captain. Uh -huh. And uh, it compares to the infantry where your company commander is a, ca is a captain and he has platoon leaders. Yeah. Okay. You got your flight leader and your two platoon leaders, who are the lieutenants. Well, sitting in the left seat, it would appear to me it would be more fun to fly wing where you had the lead plane on your left <laughs> instead of on the right where you're looking through the co-pilot. <laughs> Was there a preference? You did both. It didn't, didn't make much any matter. Not really. Now, Not did really. you fly at the same height or were there a difference in your height? We were about the same. Flew pretty much level. Pretty, pretty level. Uh, the, uh, the difficult part about uh, formation flying was at night, because you had no lights on the airplanes. So the only thing you could actually f control your position by was watching the exhaust. And if you're on the left side, uh, the left engine. That was all you had to go by. And are you <clears throat> in the same outfit through the through the whole period now, or are you getting... Same squadron. Same squadron. And you're flying out of what base again? We're at Membury in, in England. In Membury. And then we moved over to France. We were at uh, uh, Bellon, which, would be which is about 20 miles south of Paris. Okay. Uh, Membury was about 75 miles uh, west of London. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> how, where did, at what point did you move? over to France. When did that early, early 45. Early 45. I think the end of January. And what would be the normal depth of a mission? How nor normally, how far would you go forward to drop supplies or troops? You know, what would be the range of a, a normal mission? Basically, uh, when we're in England, you figured two, two and a half hours of flying each way. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Now in France, it was a lot shorter. And when we crossed the Rhine, for example, from Paris, it took us maybe an hour. To get to the Rhine? Yeah. And is there a, a lot of uh, enthusiasm for how the war is going and what's happening to the Germans and, you know? Uh, well, we knew we were winning. Uh -huh. And uh, our biggest complaint was they stopped Patton. We felt that he could have gone right straight, straight through to Berlin. Yeah, when he ran out of gas. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'd have, we'd have gotten gas to him yeah. somehow. Now, were you at all uh, faced with uh, German fighters where you would have been subject to them? Well, I had the, uh, I was one of the few, I put it this way, I had the dubious honor of being uh, strafed by an ME-262. The first German jet. No kidding. Because uh, I, uh, 
I saw these tracers going by me, and uh, all of a sudden, this looked like a measurement, but choo, like we were going backwards. Yeah. And then when I reported the intelligence, uh, they, uh, well, some days later, told me what it was. I see. And how about uh, any aircraft fire? What would be your main concern? Would it be uh, uh, cannon or cannon fire? You know, thirty-seven millimeter, fifty-seven, or would it be more, uh, uh, you know, machine guns that type of thing? Well, maybe machine gun mostly because we were low. Uh -huh. As I say, we jumped the paratroopers was about five hundred feet, took a glider and also low, because uh, they didn't want to be sitting there as a as a duck and just waiting for the, the, the Germans to shoot them. They wanted to get down to the ground as fast as possible. How many drops would you have made then in the term, your tour over there in the tour? We called the, we didn't call them missions in those days, we called them operations. Uh -huh. But 109. We, 109. We did. And, and that was not the, by any means the, the highest number in the outfit. <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> There were guys there, 150, 160. Uh -huh. And you said you were pretty lucky. You didn't lose a lot of airplanes. Was that yeah. true when you got to France also? Yeah. It stayed pretty solid. Right. And uh, how would you rate the airplane for battle damage, for being it, able to... It took an awful lot. Uh, I have a picture of one of them with about a third of, uh, of one wing gone, and it got back to the base. Uh -huh. And were you able to keep your same crew, your same uh, crew chief, and uh, or did they rotate back and you get new people? How'd... No, we had the same crew chief, the same radio operator all the time. And did you fly the same airplane all the time or did they different airplanes? Almost always the same one. So, uh, so a number the, the only, like, one time I flew a different one. Uh, we had two operations that day and my plane was being worked on. So they assigned me to Larry's plane. And uh, I had a three-day pass coming in London. We were still in England. And uh, I was complaining about that night. We were all sitting around in our room in the barracks. And uh, say if I fly like that, I was assigned the afternoon flight. If I fly that, I'll get back too late to test the last train to London. So Larry said, okay, I'll switch with you. You take the morning one, I'll take the afternoon. Said, Fine, thanks, Larry. So I flew his plane that morning. When I got back, I said to him, Larry, your plane needs work. Those engines are not the way they should be. Oh, they're fine, they're fine. Well, the trouble is you get used to your plane, you know, yeah. and you don't realize that it's going downhill. Well, to make a long story short, uh, I was getting, just ready to get the chief to go to the train station when I s saw a big ball of fire. I figured it was probably one of our planes coming back. So I went over to the uh, tower and uh, turned out it was Larry's plane. He had one engine shot out and tried to make it a one, uh, the one engine. And uh, he must have passed at least five airfields that he could have landed. No, he wanted to get back to our base yeah. and crashed just about, about a mile short of the, base, of the runway. And go home, Itis has gotten yep. more than one guy. Exactly. Yeah. I, if, I, if, I, if I had flown that afternoon mission, I'd have landed the very first place I could. I would have tried. When you think of your 109 missions, operations, what one sticks out the most in your mind? I would say, uh, except for the very first one, Bastogne. I think it was the second day uh, we took in supplies and uh, all of a sudden I saw the tracers, 50 caliber tracers coming along my left wing. Went around the prop and if you're familiar with the C-47, when you're sitting in the cockpit, you'd almost reach out and touch the prop. Came in between the prop and the fuselage of the plane, hung there for what seemed like a year, but maybe a second or so, went back out, 
and off the right wing. Not one bullet hole in the play. Hmm. And you sit there and watch it, there's nothing you can do. If I try to go sit the plane one way or the other, to either get the engine or get us, you know, you just have to wait and see what happens. That was about the worst one. How many times did you get into Bastogne before? We went in four days. Every, every day, four days? Yeah. And the fourth day, we saw the tank tracks just just short of Bastogne. We knew that we didn't have, wouldn't have to go back. When I was there, uh, there was a restaurant and bar called McGough, McGoughful, the uh, right. the um, Army general, or I think it was a general that was McGough. Yeah. McGough. Yes, There's a, a restaurant or bar there with his name on it. There's a little place in the square with his bust and all the different units that were uh -huh. were there. Uh, I spent uh, two or three days going through the whole battle. Is that right? Yeah, it's starting over in the Schnei Eiffel and, and uh, through the, the Ardennes. And apparently the Germans came in the same identical way in World War One. Mm -hmm. Same roads when they left Germany and came through the Netherlands and then. Yeah. So anyway, it was. I saw the field where you guys dropped, and uh, it's still there. There's no houses or anything in it. it uh, it's a wonderful story. It really mm -hmm. is. Yeah. Did you ever see that? Uh, DVD, the series, a uh, band of brothers. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, they show coming in the supply with a beautiful bright blue sky, <laughs> sunshine. <laughs> it wasn't that way at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you guys uh, navigated, did you have anything other than DR? I mean, when you got down low, you just have to know the countryside to get in there, wouldn't you? That was about it. Yeah. Would you have? Were the maps any good in those days? Fair. They would help. Fair. Huh? But yeah, no. you just, shall we say, you flew by the seat of your pants in that regard. You, you knew you passed a certain checkpoint that from there you had a certain distance and a certain uh, yeah. direction and you Time and distance. Used, yeah. it, but to use. Now, now what, you guys are seeing that the war is coming to an end. Um, how far into Germany did you guys, I mean, did you get all the way up to Berlin with your no. support? Where did no. you stop supporting? Actually, uh, basically, uh, we got across the Rhine by maybe 100, 100 or so miles. That's about the most we went. But uh, there's another story. I've um, been, been a member of Rotary International for a number of years. And when, I, when you join Rotary, you're supposed to give what you, they call a classification talk. You tell your background and your occupation, that sort of thing. My turn came shortly after I joined, so a member of the club was supposed to introduce me. He called and said, meet, meet him a little earlier at the meeting place, and find out my background so he could introduce me properly. He was a radi radiologist at the hospital. Uh, I got there, we got talking, and I said I flew troop carrier. He said, a troop carrier, he was a commander of a MASH outfit. He said, a troop carrier outfit took us across the Rhine. I got out my logbook. It was his outfit. Oh, I don't okay. know if it was on my plane. I, yeah, he, yeah. We didn't know each other. But uh, was, talk about coincidence, you know. Yeah, you never know, do you? Small world. You have another good story to tell when you're doing search, search and rescue. What's that? When you were doing search and rescue. Oh yeah, uh, we knew the war was going to be over on the 8th of May, which happened to be Harry Truman's uh, president's birthday and my birthday. They picked a good day. Well, we have, a couple of weeks before that we were doing search missions looking for POW camps, American POW camps. And we have a nurse on board and we'd uh, land as close as we could get the most more seriously ill, take them back with us, and bring you back where we were, so they sent in trucks had to get the rest of them. Well, this one day, we landed this base, and each time we found a POW camp, we would ask if, uh, I can't think of her name now, Mac something, if there was a guy by the name of Mac, whatever, there. 
her brother had been a, the nurse's brother had been a pilot on B-17 that was shot down. There were there no reports of how many parachutes were seen coming out. So she didn't know if he was dead or alive. But I kept asking. So this one base, at POW camp, we landed by, oh yeah, Mac, he's up right over there. One of us said, do you have a sister of name of such and such? Yeah, come with me. You should have seen that reunion. Oh, I can't imagine. She, she did, didn't know if he was dead or alive. From what I read, there were hundreds of those POW camps. Oh yeah. And uh, they were not a good place to be. But I think they were better in most cases than, uh, you know, for the Allies than it was for the Americans in Japanese prison camps. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. You know, I think that they were a little better. So, you don't go any further than 100 miles into Germany. The war ends. What happens? Well, on VE Day, uh, I shouldn't say this, I guess, but I'll just say it anyway. Uh, we decided uh, we hadn't found anything. We just had flown over there. The nurse wasn't with us that day. And uh, we are heading back toward our base. And I said to the crew, uh, what do you say we stop in, in Brussels and see what the, what's happening on VE Day? You know? Well, the city was wide open. You know, all the bars were out on the pavement. If you're uniform, you help yourself. Yeah. So we. Uh, we were there a little while and finally got a jeep, went back to the, the airport and as we were taxiing out, I said to the guys, hey, what we're at, let's go to Paris. So we went to Paris. And uh, the Montmartre again was wide open, help yourself anything you wanted. Well, my favorite place uh, was a uh, nightclub at the opposite end of the shot uh, Champs Elysees from the Arc de Triomphe. And we went there and had, we were having a drink and uh, figured, okay, it's about time to leave. And the, I went to the Maitre d' to say goodnight. He said, don't go yet. You have to stay. You have to see what's going to happen. You don't want to miss this. Okay, we'll have another drink. So we stayed there. Paris had been blacked out all these years. The Champs Elysees is four boulevards wide. They started at the Arc de Triomphe, lighting the lights on the boulevards, coming towards where we were. Well, every, every Frenchman in the place was just crying beneath the bed. It's just a beautiful sight. I'll bet. Mm -hmm. It is a wonderful uh, part of Paris. That, that. Now, is there a rotation on numbers, you know, how many? things that you have credited to you to get back, how you come home? Well, basically, when we went overseas, they said 35 missions and you come home. Well, I did my 35, but no, we need you, and so I stayed. And so and, were you one of the first to come back? Yeah. Oh. Well, right after VE Day, in fact, uh, I finally got my R&R, &R, rest of relaxation at the French Riviera in Cannes. And uh, I was there, supposed to be there a week. The fifth day, I'm just getting changed to go down and have lunch, and I'm going to go down to the beach. My The phone rang, we were staying at hotels. And uh, there's a jeep down here to pick you up, and a plane out there to the airfield to go back to your base because you're, you're assigned to go back to the States. I didn't even take the, my bathing trunks off, just put a clothes <laughs> on top of that, away I went. Now, and, uh, had you had any opportunity to communicate with your wife in any way other than letters? Just uh, letters. Just letters. Yeah. And uh, so this would have been what month of 45? June. June of 45. And how do you get home? Flew. They, in fact, uh, they brought a brand new airplane over. We flew it back, <laughs> and uh, we had. Uh, I got back that night. I was supposed to leave the next morning, so I wanted to do a gas consumption check on the plane. So I took it up and just circled the field for four hours to see how much gas would burn. So I have an idea how how we be with the trip back. 
And uh, I asked the CEO, then, what route should I take? Whichever way you want to go. And I flew over the northern route, okay, I'll go back to southern. And uh, flew down to Marseille, there they told me to wait, there's uh, some VIPs to be flown back. Turned out to be, there were three generals and three full colonels. Well, they didn't get there for several days. In the meantime, a uh, fellow went all through training with who was flying B-26s had gone to my base looking, trying to find me and found out where it was. So he flew down to Marseille. We had a little reunion. I had a case of champagne with me when I left our base in France. I finally got home with two bottles out of the case. I kept bumping at the guys I knew. Yeah. And uh, so we, from Marseille, we flew down to Morocco, and they were, uh, went into the officer's club for dinner, and uh, you, know, you feel somebody's looking at you, and I look up, there's a guy who was in my college class right across the table. <laughs> so of course, we had to have a bottle or two. So I got home with two bottles. We uh, used the one of the two, the first one, uh, when our first child was born, and the next one we got moved in our first house of our own. So oh, that, that killed the case. <laughs> Good story. Now, when you say you came the southern route from Morocco, where did you go? Down the Dakar and the Gold Coast of uh, West Coast of Africa. And then over to and over to Ascension Island. Okay. And then from there over to uh, uh, darn it, Brazil. Uh, Recife. Recife was it? No. Lean. Not darn. Rio de? No. That's okay. We've been there. We we still there. Yeah. So you're you're coming the southern route, so you have to come all the way up from Austria or from Brazil. Right. All the way up to Puerto Rico. To Puerto Rico, and then on into where Miami or in We went. In, no, we went to uh, uh, Savannah, Georgia. Okay. And. Is that home at that point, or are you still going? No, no, it, just a place to turn turn everything in. Okay, so you dumped it there. We left the plane there. And what rank are you now? First. Still first, first lieutenant. lieutenant. And then uh, we got to, from there, I was put in charge of a troop train going up the Indian Town Gap, which was not far from home. Uh-huh. So. Uh, you called there. your wife when, at some point? Were you ever, yeah. where, when's yeah. the first time you were able to get a hold of her? Yeah, that was the first week. I was able to call her. From Georgia? Yeah. And then yeah, we... Uh, in the Indian Gap, wasn't it? Where me? In the Indian Gap? No. Well, from there, I'd say we took the train up to, troop train up to the Indian Town Gap, and from there went home. Had 30 day leave. And then what happened? Besides? Well, while I was on leave, they. Mr. Truman decided that's the time to drop the bomb. And I was supposed to rejoin the outfit to go to Pacific. Instead, everything was changed. So that you were discharged shortly thereafter? No, and then from there, went back to uh, <clears throat> North Carolina to Greenville, the air base there, in which we had a, had a very arduous duty. Every day at five o'clock, I had to go to the orderly room and sign in, and then take off again until five o'clock the next day. So I called Mildred and said, come on down. And we spent the days at the swimming pool and nights at the club. <laughs> you guys earned it. Now, you, <clears throat> you know you're getting out, and uh, what's in your mind about what you want to do as a civilian? Well, basically, uh, Mildred wanted me to stay in. But in those days, you had no tour. Uh, you never knew when you were going to be moved. You might be two months here, or six months. As long as I was in one, one place in the Army, I was in England for six months. But uh, we wanted a family, and I could not see that kind of a life with a family.
-hmm. But she insisted. And I, I kept getting telegrams. Uh, I did like a second interning when I, in New York, Pennsylvania, and uh, kept getting telegrams about coming back in and coming back in. She got back. the first fight we had, I think. <laughs> I wanted him to, uh, to, uh, to go back, and he would have gotten in with the permanent commission. And, uh, yeah. and yeah. But uh, so instead, I, we wound up with four kids. So when did, so you got out at when? What, what was the date? You remember that? When you well, that was, I think, August, I finally. A 45? 45 when I got out. And then uh, so what I you, still had a lot of leave coming to me, so it was actually I was on getting pay until October. <laughs> now, the whole time you were in Europe, did you get involved at all with your saxophone? With what? With your saxophone. Was there any music? Once. No, 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 twice, twice. Once I sat in with the uh, army band, where they played at our base. And the second time, I don't know if you ever heard of D'Angelo Reinhardt, but he was considered the world's best guitarist. I was in the Montmartre, walking along the street there, and I heard this terrific jazz. It's a basement place. I went down there and ordered a drink and listened to them. It was D'Angelo Reinhardt and his, and his combo. So during their intermission, I got talking to him and said, hey, I played the tenor sax. And a little while later, he comes over with the tenor sax they had in the back room. So I sat in with him. Oh, what a thrill. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So you get out, your wife is with you, mm -hmm. and what's your decision as to what you want to do? Where do you... Well, I wanted to go and practice. Yes, however, an optometrist? As an optometrist. Okay. So I uh, had not practiced optometry, and that was three years later. So I uh, went, actually did like a second interning. I went to work for, for fortunately, very fortunately, a very successful optometrist in York, Pennsylvania. And uh, stayed with him just about a year. <clears throat> I uh, was never one to work for somebody permanently, so I talked to him one day about coming in to being able to eventually buy the practice. He said, not until my son decides what he wants to do. I want to save it for him. His son was six years old. <laughs> <laughs> it turned out his son eventually did take over the practice. But uh, then we decided, okay, we'll go for ourselves. And we checked a few towns out, and, and uh, Pottstown looked like a pretty good bet. So we decided to open an office there. And we never regretted it. And you Lucky. had four children then in Potsdam? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, one was born we was living with our in-laws in Philadelphia. He first stepped in the office. We couldn't find a place to live for one thing. We also didn't have the money. <laughs> why, why don't you sit up there for a minute? We'll chat. Go ahead. We'll get you. We'll take a few minutes now. You know, um, May. Mildred. Yeah, um, go quick then. Your parents, do you remember how they were met and where they're from? Well, my mother was born over in Europe. She came over when she was two years old. And my dad was born here. And uh, my mother and father met through, they, they were in a group of friends. My mother's best friend was my, my father's cousin. And uh, they had a, a young men and young women that uh, went around together, then my mother and dad got together, got married. And uh, What nationality would that have been then? Probably Russian. Russian. And, uh, it might have been Poland or Russian, but it, you never knew what it was at the, in those days. Now, how were, what was the sequence of your children? How were they born? Our uh, first child was born uh, January of 47. Yeah. Actually, they were like two years and two months old and then three years or something. But in school, we were very fortunate. They were all three years apart. Okay. So when one was a senior in, in college, the other was a freshman. And so and, uh, was a girl, boy, boy, girl? How did that go? Our first child was a boy. Okay. And we named him Roger. 
And then we had a, we had a Dalmatian dog, and, he, and our dog's name was Wilco. <laughs> so we had Roger Wilco. Huh. And now, then, where, where, where's Roger now? Roger's in, is still in Pottstown. He's a, a financial advisor. Okay. He uh, went to Vietnam as an officer, and he stayed in the uh, National Guard, and he's a, a colonel, retired and, colonel. And uh, he has children? Yes, he has two daughters. Okay, and their names? Heather and uh, Kristen. Okay, now the next child. Next child was Barbara. Okay. And uh, she came along, and uh, she should have been out. <laughs> but no, <laughs> we figured she better give her a name. And uh, Barbara is uh, married to a, a Dutchman. And they live in Venice, California. And we on our way down here. We stopped there for a, a number of days. She brought us down here. And uh, they come every weekend, and we're here. We'll go back to their house and spend about five days before we go back. To and they have children? Uh, he has two children from previous marriages. And their names? Uh, son and... Vera and Son. Okay. Son is German. And the next child? And next child is, is John. And uh, he is in the Kansas... Uh, he's the... Uh, as a, a doctor in... He's a vice provost. And vice provost at the University of Missouri in uh, Kansas City. But he lives over across the river in, uh, in Overland Park, uh, Kansas. And children? He has uh, two daughters, Hallie and uh, Sarah. Okay. And then we have our youngest child is uh, Nancy. And she uh, lives in uh, uh, Terrell, Texas, about 35 miles east of, uh, of Dallas. Okay. And uh, she has one son. Dylan. Okay. Is he still married? Yes. Okay. Her husband's name? Her husband is Michael Powers, okay. and he's a he's a paraplegic. Okay. And when he was 16 years old, he and his friend were driving on a four-lane highway in, in Dallas, and uh, there was a uh, man being uh, who was drunk and being chased by the police. He lost control of the car and went right across the highway, struck the car that Michael was in. Michael was not the driver. And his, the driver was killed instantly. Michael was in the front seat, and he was pronounced dead three times before they really brought him back. So that's why he's a paraplegic. And she married a paraplegic. Yeah, that's wonderful. She said ten minutes after talking to him, she didn't see the didn't see the wheelchair. But he has made quite a success of his life. He uh, started an organization called Point Paraplegics on Independent Nature Trails, and he uh, promotes. Uh, Activities for paraplegics. They climbed the highest mountain in uh, in Texas a number of years, many years ago when Reagan was president, and uh, three of them got to the top, and the president called Michael and, and spoke to him, congratulating him, and they were on all the news programs, all yeah. the big programs, and that was quite <clears throat> thrill. And uh, now he works more with uh, with the uh, with young paraplegics, young children. He takes them camping, he takes them, and he says to them, you know, if they, if they can't do something, he's like, you have to do it. I can't, I'm no better than you are. <laughs> now, all the children were born in Potsdam? In, in, in Pennsylvania? The last three were born last in three were born. First one was born in Philadelphia, the other three were born in Potsdam. And so at some point then, you closed your practice down, or is it still operating? Actually, I just retired uh, December 31st. So we had a bad automobile accident and very back bad. in, in uh, October, beginning yeah. of October. You were in an automobile? Yeah. yeah. And uh, I spent quite a few days in a trauma unit and all that sort of thing, but uh, fortunately I'm coming along and uh, I figured I was no longer able to practice. I've been practicing part-time for a number of years. So, But how long then would that practice have been? I was in pr private practice for six, 62 years. Wow. And your age now? 86. 86. I won't ask. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I'm in my 80s, but not as far, not as, far as he is. my child bride. <laughs> and when you think back on it, uh, is there one thing that sticks out in your mind in your life that may have been a, a life-changing experience or something that when, you, when your mind wanders, it kind of ends up there more often than anything else? Is there something that Hit you in particular? Well, I remember a wedding day. Good. Uh, it was a hurry up type thing. In fact, the only 
mementos we have of it are a half dozen snapshots that were taken uh, out on the front steps of where we were married. Who was your best man? No. Was it a was it a, a, a minister or did you go to a justice well, for peace or? Well, actually, it's a long story. <laughs> uh, we uh, got engaged through the mail, and uh, he wanted me to come out to Missouri to get married. And my I was underage. My father said no, no. He said if he comes here, you can get married. But otherwise, he he, would, he referred me just to be engaged. When he came back from overseas, we knew he was going overseas. When he came back from overseas, they'd get married. Well, I was at the dentist's uh, office on a Thursday morning, and I got a call from his mother. She said, Hal's been trying to reach you. Uh, he's coming in on Saturday. Make arrangements to get married. This is Thursday morning. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was in such a daze. My dad's office was across the street from, the, uh, from City Hall in Philadelphia, and he knew the judges and so forth over there. So... In the days, I walked from Fifth and Arch all the way down to Broad Street. Not even I could have taken the trolley, but I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> and I went to my dad, who was not for us getting married yet, and he did it all. He took me over to City Hall and talked to the judge, and uh, I got to the pre preliminary. And I was uh, working at I was at, in, in training at Jefferson Hospital, so I had no trouble getting my medical things at all. And he came in on Saturday morning <laughs> and I, at 8 o'clock in the morning at, at North Philadelphia train station. And I looked at him and I thought, oh, my gosh, is that what I'm marrying? <laughs> he had been up all night. He had been on bivouac for, what, four days and then mm. had a chance.